Ok. Tu adoramos con celebrated the Easter Vigil and lit the Easter fire down by what we now call the Easter tree at the other end of the valley. We processed up, walked up in the dark, lighting our candles, celebrating that great symbol of light which is at the heart of Easter. And then after the gospel, we, we renewed our baptismal promises with water. These two great symbols of the mystical journey, water and fire. And it reminds us that Christianity, Christian faith is a mystical religion, much more than a morality. And today, as we celebrate the, the resurrection of Jesus, we are celebrating the deepest and most far-reaching mystical, contemplative, spiritual explosion uh, in the history of humanity. So we welcome you to our celebration here and we hold in our hearts all of our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering at this time, who are still on the cross of their personal suffering, social suffering as a result of this epidemic. So we hold them in our hearts, all those who have died and those who are mourning for them, those who are finding life in shutdown or lockup uh, very painful, difficult. We remember those families where domestic violence has become a serious problem. So we pray that the grace of what we're celebrating today in our common faith will in some way as mysterious as the resurrection itself will spread out from here and bring healing and hope and life to all parts of the world. And that will happen if it happens within us. And so let us prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. spirit.
to take a few moments to gather ourselves, to open our heart to the mystery that we have come to celebrate today. I was hearing a woman say the other day, we were talking about pain in life, and she was talking about the pain of childbirth, how difficult it, it was while it lasted, but that with the joy of the birth, the memory, the actual memory of that pain disappeared. And I think this is what happens in the resurrection to our shame, our guilt, all the things that we would have thought as early disciples would have been feeling as Jesus became present to them in the resurrection, that memory of the suffering of sin, the mistakes we made, even the memory of it just evaporates. It's no longer relevant. So let's really open our hearts and minds to that incredible power of grace that reverses the memory, reverses the influence of the darkness in the world and the darkness in ourselves and leads us into a light which is beyond all darkness. The light of acceptance, where we are accepted, where we know that we are good because God looks into us and sees the image of himself in the word in us. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us all, forgive us our sin, and bring us all into the fullness of the life of the risen Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are the source of all that exists here on this earth and to the farthest reaches of the cosmos. Today is the day of Easter joy, the joy of being itself bursting into the human realm. This is the morning on which the Lord appeared to all humanity. We had begun to lose hope, just as many today in this global time of suffering are feeling despair, heavy of heart. He opened their eyes to the meaning of the great scriptures that first there must be death, and he must die, and then there will be resurrection, and he would rise and descend into his Father's glorious presence. So may the risen Lord breathe on our minds, touch our hearts, open our eyes, transform our way of seeing, so that we may know him this morning, in the word that we listen to, in the sacrament that we celebrate, in the friendship that brings us together in our common faith, in the silence of our meditation, that we may see him in the breaking of the bread and we may follow him and be filled with his risen life. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. First reading is from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter addressed Cornelius in his household. 
You must have heard about the recent happenings in Judea, about Jesus of Nazareth and how he began in Galilee after John had been preaching baptism. God had anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power because God was with him. Jesus went about doing good and curing all who had fallen into the power of the devil. Now I and those with me can witness to everything he did throughout the countryside of Judea and in Jerusalem itself. And also to the fact that they killed him by hanging him on a tree. But three days afterwards, God raised him to life and allowed him to be seen, not by the whole people, but only by certain witnesses God had chosen beforehand. Now we are those witnesses. We have eaten and drunk with him after his resurrection from the dead. And he has ordered us to proclaim this to his people and to tell them that God has appointed him to judge everyone, alive or dead. It is to him that all the prophets bear this witness, that all who believe in Jesus will have their sins forgiven through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After the frightened and cowering disciples had been touched by this resurrection experience, they suddenly seemed to become filled with confidence and courage and the desire, the zeal to tell the story. You see here uh, Peter telling the founding story, just as parents tell their children how they met in the early days of their marriage and their family. And just as every community like ours retells, remembers the story of its own origin, its own family, it's natural that we should tell and retell these original stories because they shape us we find our meaning in them. And every time we relive them, we retell them, we understand the meaning that we are part of, the story that we have now entered and in which we are playing our part. The resurrection is the great sign of our empowerment we're not just putting Jesus on some kind of cultic totem pole. We are empowered by him, challenged and supported by him in carrying on the work that he began. The work of healing, the work of reconciling, and the work of revealing humanity's potential to itself. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his love has no end. Let the sons of Israel say, 
His love has no end. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord's right hand has triumphed. This is the work of the Lord, a marvel in our eyes. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. His right hand raised me up. I shall not die. I shall live and recount his deeds. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Lecture de la lettre de Saint Paul apôtre aux Colossiens. Si vous êtes ressuscité avec le Christ, recherchez les réalités d'en haut. C'est là qu'est le Christ, assis à la droite de Dieu. Pensez aux réalités d'en haut, non à celles de la terre. En effet, vous êtes passé par la mort et votre vie reste cachée avec le Christ en Dieu. Quand paraîtra le Christ, votre vie, alors vous aussi, vous paraîtrez avec lui dans la gloire. Parole du Seigneur. Nous, 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 Whenever I read this uh, reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians, I remember a moment when I was being examined for my novitiate, a monastic novitiate, and the monk, the monk who was examining me to see whether I got it right kept on trying to get out of me what, I, what he wanted me to say, which was exactly what St. Paul is saying here, it's one of the ways in which the monastic life is understood uh, in the monastic tradition, that our life is hidden with Christ in God. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. There are many ways in which we can understand that. But what it reminds us is we, we may not be famous, we may have nothing apparently that the world is interested in. We're not ambitious. But at the deepest level, where our life is hidden with Christ in God, we are important. We are precious. We are sacred. We are valuable. This is what St. Paul is saying here, I think. If we really are touched by the resurrection, touched by the spirit of the risen Christ, then we are no longer satisfied with just staying on the surface of things, just pursuing superficial and transitory satisfactions and things that will please us, give us a sense of achievement for a while, but really of no great significance or depth. Maybe for many people, this time of crisis, so many people have already lost their jobs, so many people are working at home, our lives, our ordinary lives have been totally disrupted. 
And this has not only been disruptive, but maybe also it's been a creative disruption. Maybe it is making us think about the deeper meaning, the deeper purpose of our work and of the way we live. Shout hallelujah, O Seigneur. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Let us celebrate the feast in the Lord. Shout hallelujah, O Seigneur. Shout hallelujah, O Seigneur. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, O Seigneur. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. It was very early on the first day of the week and still dark when Mary of Magdala came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been moved away from the tomb and she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, she said, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter set out with the other disciple to go to the tomb. They ran together, but the other disciple, running faster than Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent down and saw the linen cloths lying on the ground, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, who was following, now came up, went right into the tomb, saw the linen cloths on the ground, and also the cloth that had been over his head. This was not with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and he believed. Till this moment, they failed to understand the meaning of scripture, that he must rise from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Reflect for a moment quietly on the on that gospel in the way that the story is told in this gospel. Again, it's the woman, Mary Magdala, who's the first to realize that something has happened. Has happened. They're the first witnesses of the resurrection. Extraordinary for that culture that women should be seem to be at the forefront leaders of the communication of the good news. And we have this sort of race uh, between John, the beloved disciple, and Peter running towards the tomb. And this has been interpreted in the tradition as symbolizing First of all, John, the beloved disciple, is a symbol of love. Love runs faster than anything. Love gets to the heart of things in one leap, in an instant. So John got to the tomb first. 
And when they saw, they believed. What did they see? Nothing. They saw an empty tomb. Let's just reflect on that as we came in and, and uh, at the beginning of the mass, I think the camera was focused on the centerpiece of the, of the barn here of our sacred space today, which is symbolizing the empty tomb, surrounded by the flowers, the stones from Bonbo, an empty space. Why is it empty? This is a Christian feast, obviously. The Christian feast. But no one is excluded from it. You don't have to be in the church, you don't have to have been baptized, you don't have to be anything except human. Because the very meaning of this feast is that it is a festival of humanity, of humanity's potential, of our true nature. Not just about survival, but rising from the ashes, rising into fullness of life. Today, as we see the epidemic uh, unfolding, and we're trying to understand what it means, what it's telling us, what it's meaning for the future, but how our life will be afterwards. Most of us feel life should be different afterwards. But as we see this epidemic unfolding, perhaps we see a first taste of what humanity has produced for itself over the last 150 years or so. And we've known for some time that the way we were living was wrong. It was crazy, in fact, and it was unsustainable. You can't just keep on growing your GDP every year. You can't just keep on living on fossil fuels. You can't keep just exhausting yourself psychologically in, in order to be successful. We may see more clearly as a result of this time, we may be already seeing it in some cases, that survival itself is in question now. It is a question of survival. But if survival is to happen, then we need to remember our spiritual potential if we are to survive at all. Because for human beings, survival is not enough. For human beings, we have to be able to live and to grow in fullness of life. We're never satisfied with what we've got. We always want to be more alive. That's the spirit of God awakening in us. That's our hunger for God. It's not a hunger for wealth, for fame, for power, for entertainment, for trips, for gadgets. It's a hunger for God that no substitute can ever match. We have to discover or rediscover to remember our spiritual nature, our spiritual potential, if we are to survive and rise from death. We have many deaths, many deaths in one life. In one sense, we die every night when we go to sleep. In one sense, we die with every breath, between breaths. And there are emotional deaths. 
There are deaths as we pass from one phase of life to another. Death is only part of life, a necessary part of it, as nature constantly reminds us, not the end of life. We now have an amazing capacity, and thank God that that technical capacity is being used to save lives at the moment. We have an amazing capacity to put people on life support. That life support is meant to get us through a crisis so that we can live again and live in a different way. After every death or near death, we have to live differently. We can't go back, we can't just repeat ourselves. This is, in fact, the necessary wisdom of death in our life, in the life of nature and the life of humanity. Survival isn't enough. We would despair if it was only a question of survival. We would get bored to death. So we have to flourish, we have to take risks, we have to change. And sometimes it takes a crisis to push us into something new, to be reborn into a fuller life. So how does the resurrection help us today to do this? It's not easy to say. It's not easy for Christians just to say, oh, Jesus raised, rose from the dead, everything's going to be okay, you don't have to worry about anything. It's not as easy as that. Like meditation, resurrection is about experience. You can talk about it, but you won't know what it means until you experience it. It's not a theory. And what is the great symbol of the resurrection? As I said, it's the empty tomb. This is the common feature of all the Gospels. And the scholars and the historians are still arguing about what it means. Was it historical? Was it actually empty? Was that just a, a symbolic myth to say that the early Christians had seen and felt Jesus present to them after his death. But just to speak about the empty tomb is just a symbol. What does it mean historically or symbolically or theologically? No easy answers to that. Each of us has to find our own response to it. We can find it by sharing with the tradition by sharing with each other. But it's the empty tomb. In one of the gospels, there's this description of two angels, one at the head of the slab where the body would have been laid and the other at the foot of the slab. What does that symbolize? That is probably symbolic, the two angels dressed in white. But what does it symbolize? It symbolizes the great image of the Jewish people of the presence of God in the, in the ark. And the presence of God is between these two angels, the two cherubim on the ark of the covenant. The space between them is empty, but that space is where the presence is. So there's no image, no cultic object there. It's just space, empty space. But that empty space is where the body was, and it is also the sign of the full presence. 
So it's an absent presence and a present absence. So this isn't very easy to sell, this kind of idea. And it was difficult for the early Christians to understand it and to communicate it as well. And they weren't communicating an argument or an ideology. They were trying to share an experience that had transformed their lives and led them to live life differently. So the resurrection is not a neat little news story, which journalists can come in and take pictures of and give different opinions about. It's a paradox, it's a mystery. It's something real, but something we can't put into words like meditation. And as the early Christians tried to find the words and do the best they could to explain it, their opponents made fun of them. They said, what a ridiculous story to have. You can't be taken seriously as a, as a religion if you have such a stupid story. This is just magic and myth. And they said, well, okay, if Jesus had raised, uh, risen from the dead, okay, why didn't he go and confront Pilate and Herod and the chief priests and the crowd that had called for his death? Why didn't he go and show himself to them and get his own back and take revenge on them, put them straight? But we can't approach the resurrection in that, with that mindset. What we can see is that he didn't rebuke anyone. As they saw him, touched him, felt his presence, they never felt that he rebuked them, condemned them, criticized them. He was empowering them with his presence and pushing them out into a new life. So why is this the great symbol, this empty tomb? Perhaps because it is so difficult to explain or imagine. It's why Christianity can't really wrap it up in a formula. And Christianity cannot even claim Jesus all for itself. It's also because from this moment of the empty tomb, when the presence becomes within us and among us, both in us, we could understand that, my deepest self and so on, but also among us, the same presence is in our interaction in the way communities form, the way we live day by day here at Bombo or in your families. That same presence is at work among us as is at work deep within us in our inner room. Same presence. And this calls for a new kind of prayer, a new kind of religion. Jesus called it worship in spirit and in truth. Now, of course, Christianity became a religion and an institution, and it needs to be, and has done a lot of good. It gets a lot of criticism, of course, but it has done a huge amount of good throughout 2,000 years. It's sinful, it's made lots of mistakes, but it's done tremendous work. And yet that institution itself has to be put in its proper place. It's the presence of Christ in us and among us that is the real church, the mystical body of Christ, not the institution by itself. The institution is a form, an instrument 
something sacred and something amazing, mysterious, but it's the presence that really matters. And this calls for a new kind of prayer. May Christians who are going to penetrate into the mystery of the risen Christ need to be contemplative. Why we need to integrate the pure prayer of presence, the silence of meditation, into whatever other kind of prayer we practice and into our daily life. A Christian who is not contemplative will have a very hard time believing and certainly a hard time of convincing others. The risen Jesus is a healing presence, a saving force for everyone, not just for those who have been physically baptized, not just for those who go to church, but a healing presence in humanity itself, present in every human person. And we don't discover this only through arguments or ideology or theology, but that won't prove it to us. The only or well, the best proof is experience. And that's why meditation is necessary to take us into the mystery of the resurrection and to understand why emptiness is nothing to be frightened of. Stillness, silence is nothing to be frightened of. But the deeper we go into that emptiness, the more we will find that presence, poverty of spirit. And so the tomb itself is transformed symbolically into a womb. Absence, which of course makes us sad. And we see the disciples weeping at first when they thought that even the body of Jesus had been taken away from them. Absence is sad. But that absence can be transfigured into presence. So this is not easy to grasp, and it's not meant to be easy to grasp, because we have to move from that level of mind where things are easy to grasp to a deeper level. It's a bit like a koan, which is designed to bring us to the cliff edge of the mind to that limit of thought and language and expression. And what happens at that cliff edge, which we are constantly coming to, if we are living a contemplative life, we're constantly living on the edge. What happens is not that we get a logical proof or of physical evidence, not of the mystery of Christ at this level, but we get a personal recognition. <clears throat> it's like the difference in Buddhist theory between sudden enlightenment in the Rinzai school where you're suddenly, your mind is open, you're enlightened, and gradual enlightenment. And there's a debate and argument, maybe, I don't know, between these two schools of meditation and enlightenment. But I think if we're living on the edge, living in the spirit, then we are living, in fact, both kinds of enlightenment, recognition brings us to moments of sudden enlightenment, 
But then those moments of sudden enlightenment need to be tested. They have to be uh, integrated in our lives and with everything else we've learned. They're both together. That's the Christian life. With that sense of immediate presence and at the same time always further to go. The alternative to that is just living on the surface of life or being trivial. Jesus is not a dead founder. And he's not just a heavenly Lord up there in the stratosphere. What we celebrate, what we try to repeat at Easter is the amazing revelation of disclosing that he is a presence within us and among us. And he's continuing God's work in the world, in humanity, as he did during his earthly life. So the empty tomb is not just an embarrassment or it's not just uh, an accidental detail. It really does seem to be the key to understanding the resurrection. And meditation can be seen to be our way of accepting that key and entering into that presence. Take a moment now to offer our prayers, our petitions, our intercessions. We can do that here in the barn at Bonvo, or you can do it at home in your living room or wherever you're participating in this Mass, aloud or in the silence of your hearts. Let's pray. First of all, for all those who have the greatest need at this moment, anywhere in the world, I think especially of those in intensive care, I think of those medical people, profession, professionals who are caring for the sick, often without proper resources to protect themselves. Let's remember the people around the world in refugee camps who are the most vulnerable to infection. Let's think of those hundreds of thousands or more of Indian migrant workers who are trapped. Let's hold all of us, all of our human family, in prayer, in compassionate regard. And let's pray that in some way, this affirmation of human potential, of human meaning, that we celebrate in the resurrection, will be felt where it is needed most. Would anyone like to offer any any prayers? 
And we like to pray for all the families who are separated during this uh, time of Easter, who normally celebrate Easter together and uh, might be in different countries or different homes. May they still find, be united or feel united uh, through the spirit mm -hmm. and not only through the net, and, uh, but in communion, in prayer and love. And uh, may they feel that this um, union is very strong and true and uh, somehow bounds the whole world together. I'd like to pray for the elders in our communities all around the world who are alone in their homes, maybe separated from family because family is not able to visit or not allowed to visit. And I'd also like to pray for the poor on the streets in crowded cities, the poor that we see but also the poor that we don't see, those on very low income who are now frightened and struggling. Lord, in your mercy. And let us also pray for all the people who have lost a loved one, a member of their family, a friend, and who are in grief for this loss. May they find the strength to accept this and go through the difficult time. Say a word about the book, book of prayer. Yes. <laughs> um, so we have now a book. I, I last uh, mass that we had together, we were talking about having a book where uh, everybody could send their names if they want to have their name in, in this book, and uh, we will uh, take your name and unite you in our prayer in our life here to, in Volvo and ask times of meditation. So if you would like to send your name, uh, do it, do send it to anyone of us, if you know people here in Volvo, or to Leo or other people in the community, and they will send it to us and we will write your name. You will see that the book is at the foot of the altar. So we will keep you in our prayer. Lord, you, you tell us to set our troubled hearts at rest and to banish our fears so that we can feel the joy that you, yourself, communicate, the joy of your presence. Help us even in these difficult and painful times to learn to do that. We pray that we may be able to support and help each other and that we will grow in understanding your presence within us and among us. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
My brothers and sisters, let us pray that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands, and praise the Lord of His mercy. Amen. 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 Amen.
may be filled with his Holy Spirit and become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make us an everlasting gift to you and enable us to share in the inheritance of your saints with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles, the martyrs, St. Benedict and all your saints on whose constant intercession we rely for help. Lord, may this sacrifice, which has made our peace with you, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Strengthen in faith and love of your pilgrim church on earth, your servant, Pope Francis, our Bishop Pascal, with all your ministers, with all those who serve you with sincere hearts. We pray for unity among all Christians, that we may transcend our, diff our, our barriers and divisions in the common faith in the resurrection. We pray for friendship and participation among people of all faiths for the good of the world. Welcome into your kingdom, our departed brothers and sisters, and all who have left this world in your friendship. We hope to enjoy forever the vision of your glory through Christ our Lord, from whom all good things come. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you, wherever you may be, in any part of the world, speaking any language, that you join us in the Lord's Prayer, spoken in your mother tongue. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin, and protect us from all anxiety, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sin, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and the unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the risen Lord be with you all.
the system down with God. The risen one who calls us into the fullness of his life. Happy are we who recognize him in each other, in our own hearts, and in the breaking of the bread. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my room, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. And the body and blood of Christ bring us to everlasting life. Amen. I invite you to join us in our time of meditation. We meditate for about 15 minutes. And this is what uh, an integral part of our celebration of the Eucharist. If you're new to meditation, let me very briefly describe the way, the tradition we follow. First of all, we sit still, alert, but relaxed. We close our eyes lightly. And then silently, interiorly, we repeat our word, our mantra. And the repeating of the word is so that we can lay aside our thoughts. Anxious thoughts, fantasy thoughts, Sad thoughts, hopeful thoughts, all thoughts. We let, let go of our thoughts so that we can move from the mind into the heart. The word we recommend is the word Maranatha. In ancient Christian prayer, it means come, Lord. We don't think about the meaning of it. But we say it in faith. Ma ra na tha. Ma ra na tha.
Now let us end our prayer. Let us give thanks for the communion which we have shared. In the spirit, uniting us through time and space. Let us give thanks for the community that we are and that has been nourished by this time of prayer together, of word and silence. And let us hold in our hearts all those who seek a meaningful response to this crisis in their lives, who seek a path to follow. May we be of service to them as a community. We ask this in the joy of the risen Lord, Christ our Lord. Amen. So, it's good for us to feel connected with you, and I hope that you have been helped by being with us here in the barn. Just to let you know that, um, of course, here in the, uh, in the community of Bonbeau, during this time, we are meditating, praying uh, throughout the day, morning, midday, and evening. And we're planning, uh, maybe uh, in the coming week, maybe Wednesday or so, to start a, uh, a transmission live of one of our meditation sessions. Many people have asked about this, if this were possible. I think it should be, uh, but we need to look into the technicalities of it a bit, but uh, so very soon we'll be inviting you to join us for one of those meditation sessions, which lasts about 40, 45 minutes, uh, some simple readings and chant, and then uh, a half hour of meditation and another short reading and, and conclusion. So we'll let you know about that through the website. And the website uh, which we've just started, called Contemplative Path Through the Crisis, has now been launched, and it's uh, building up in an editorial group, um, working on that every week to provide new and suitable uh, material to help people in different ways in different areas of concern. So have a look at that website if you haven't seen it. Contemplative approach. Uh, sorry, contemplative path through the crisis. Uh, you'll find the link uh, on the website, the WCCM home website. And uh, if you want to sign up for that, you can just, just by putting your name, we'll send you updates as they are made. And we welcome your input and anything that you think you would find useful or you think other people would find useful, let us know so that we can uh, try to respond to that and include it. So let's ask God's blessing on each one of us, and our families and friends. We pray especially that this blessing may touch the secret hearts of those who are lonely and isolated, frightened at this time. Father of love, watch over the world and bring us through this crisis with wisdom and insight so that we may truly see the glory of your resurrection performed in Jesus and promised by this Easter sacrament. Let us bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. May Almighty God bless us on this great feast of Easter, filling us with hope, confidence and healing. Through the resurrection of Jesus, God has granted us healing within ourselves and among ourselves. May the spirit of wisdom and compassion 
fill the minds and hearts of our leaders, of those who are serving us, and of all our interactions. We have mourned for Christ's sufferings in Holy Week, and now we celebrate the joy of his resurrection. May we come with joy to that feast which lasts forever. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Because we have missed being able to sing Alleluia for so long, uh, Nicola is going to lead us in in it once more to conclude our our uh, celebration this morning.